Professor Riker earned a law degree at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and his academic career has included positions at numerous law schools in Australia and in the United States. During the past 15 years, he served as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where he teaches courses on a variety of topics, including law and the Holocaust and international human rights. In 2004, his, interna- excuse me, his innovative work on the Holocaust and the law was acknowledged by President Bush, who appointed Professor Riker to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, where he served until 2008. He continues to serve on the museum's academic committee and committee on conscience. In 2004, the city of Bayonne, New Jersey, honored him by proclaiming April 18th to be, quote, Professor Harry Riker Day. And the two houses of the New Jersey State Legislature passed a joint resolution commending his work. His talk today is entitled, President Truman's Historic Role in the Nuremberg Trials and in Holocaust-Era Refugee Policy. Please join me in a warm welcome for Harry Riker. My big regret about that memorable day in Bayonne was that I didn't drive there that day, so I couldn't park illegally and get off from a parking ticket because that was Professor Harry Riker Day in the city of Bayonne. And then on my way out of Bayonne, Bayonne, I was informed a little bit about Hudson County politics, which took a little of the shine off my proclamation that I... (laughs) I'm honoured to be here. The conception behind this conference is brilliant, I believe, and I've now uh, got the additional burden, I would say, of following two outstanding speakers. Uh, the, Raff- the David Wyman Institute, uh, represented here by Dr. Medoff this morning, has really carved out for itself a unique niche in Holocaust research and study and teaching in this country by focusing on the many and varied responses that took place in this country to the various aspects of the Holocaust. Today, at the end of the first decade of the 21st century, there is much which we take for granted about international law, international human rights law, and international criminal law. We open the newspapers, or we switch on a radio, switch on a television, and we read and see and hear stories about important trials arising out of major human rights atrocities in a variety of exotic places. The former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, Iraq, and so on. There are terms and phrases which roll naturally off the tongue today. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. These have become part and parcel of the daily vocabulary. So much so that we've become a little blasé about these things to the extent that if someone has come of age during the first decade of the 21st century, that person can be excused for thinking that this is just the natural order of things. That's the way it just has to be. Someone commits terrible atrocities, they're captured, hauled before a court, they're charged, they're put through a trial, and if they're found guilty, they're dealt with. When we look at it from that perspective, it's very difficult to imagine that a mere 65 years ago, none of this existed. 65 years ago this month, there started the work of the first ever international tribunal in history set up to try crimes against international law directly on the international plane. Nothing like that had ever existed before. If we therefore contrast the situation today in the year 2010 with the situation in 1945, even in those very brief terms, it's very clear that we're talking about a revolution. We're talking about a massive transformation 
in international law, international human rights law, and international criminal law. The catalyst of this, for this, I should say, was the Holocaust, and specifically for our purposes, the Nuremberg Trials. This is an appropriate, a particularly propitious time to discuss the Nuremberg Trials and their abiding impact into the 21st century because, as I've indicated, this month actually marks the 65th anniversary of the beginning of the major trial against Hermann Goering and others. Immediately after the Holocaust and the Second World War, priority number one was bringing perpetrators to justice. We owe an enormous debt of gratitude to President Harry Truman, who worked hand in glove with Robert Jackson, a justice of the US Supreme Court, who stepped down for a while to assume the position of chief US prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. The two had known one another since President Truman's days in the Senate when Jackson was Solicitor General and later on Attorney General. They had formed a warm friendship and a mutual respect uh, flowed between them. President Truman argued very, very strongly and pressed with considerable effort the, uh, that there should be orderly trials arising out of the Second World War and the Holocaust. And he and Jackson offered three principal rationales for insisting on orderly trials. The first of these was to set international law precedents. International law, like every system of law, works by precedent. Lawyers look to the past, judges look to the past, in order to determine how cases should be decided today and in the future. In opening the trial of the major war criminals, Goering and others, the presiding judge, Sir Geoffrey Lawrence, intoned in very solemn terms that, quote, the trial which we are now about to commence is unique in the history of the jurisprudence of the world. And it was unique in the history of the jurisprudence of the world. In being unique, in its uniqueness, it gave effect to what Truman wanted to achieve as rationale number one, and that was to create precedents in international law to send signals, clear, unambiguous, unequivocal signals to future Hitlers and would-be Hitlers. This is the fate that potentially awaits you should you choose to go down the same path. The new precedents that were created were both procedural as well as substantive. At the procedural level, the very fact that the trials took place was a major breakthrough. As I've indicated, there had never before been an international tribunal of any sort to try crimes against international law. There had been some talk about it after the First World War. There had even been talk about bringing Kaiser Wilhelm to justice, but nothing ever came of those discussions. Today, we take it for granted that if someone commits terrible atrocities, they should be brought before a court. It was far from obvious in 1945. Truman was vigorously opposed from a number of quarters, some of them highly respectable, and the suggestion was that rather than have trials, that was unnecessary, and the leaders of Nazi Germany should rather be dealt with by what was euphemistically termed a political solution, quote-unquote. And political solution meant very simply we know who these guys are, we know what they've done, we know who's responsible, just take them out, put guns to their heads, and finish them off. That was what was euphemistically known as a political solution. Truman, aided by Jackson, insisted, no, we have to have orderly trials, and he worked at the diplomatic level to persuade 
not only rogue elements, but more importantly, respectable elements in the international community that this was the proper thing, the proper way to approach it. In particular, the British were very strongly against international trials initially, including Churchill. The British War Cabinet, meeting in solemn session in London, decided initially that they would prefer a political solution. Eventually, they came around, but very, very significantly, that was because of uh, Truman's efforts. There's a very interesting piece of archival footage of President Truman talking about this aspect of the work to ensure that there were orderly trials. And with the help of Ellis in the, in the uh, projection booth, I'll invite him to show the first clip on the DVD. These atrocities had to be punished, but how? We can hear him. Kill the Nazis off? That would be the same animal program which they had been following themselves. Wherever you our are, Harry Truman, trial. in heaven, we hear but you today. Surprise, there he is. Our allies wanted execution without okay. trial. We can't hear it properly. I had a tough battle ahead of me, but that was after. First, we had to help win the war against these murderous... Could we replay that, please? That's the end of the first clip. This is from a rem wonderful... 13-part series that Truman recorded after his retirement, the and as a kid, I watched this in Australia. Should we kill the Nazis, Nazis off? That would be the same animal program which they had been following themselves. I wanted civilized trial, but to my surprise, our allies wanted execution without trial. I had a tough battle ahead of me, but that was after First, we had to help win the war against these murderous fanatics. Thank you, Ellis. His point is, our allies wanted to finish them off, kill them, but his point was, and I'll come back to it, a very important moral point. Doing it that way would be acting in exactly way, the way that they had acted. It would mean descending down into the gutter with them. And it's a point that I want to emphasize at this stage because what emerges from Truman's role, both in the Nuremberg trials and in post-World War II refugee policy, is an extraordinary moral clarity, which in my eyes makes him a hero. Today, 65 years later, the Nuremberg precedent of bringing perpetrators of major human rights atrocities to trial continues. It abides in particular in the tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, which are the most direct descendants of the Nuremberg tribunals. The Nuremberg tribunals were international tribunals set up by the agreement of the four major allied victors. The tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda were set up in 1993 and 1994, respectively, by resolutions of the Security Council. But they're international tribunals in the purest form, and they are ad hoc tribunals, as the Nuremberg uh, trial, uh, tribunals were. And I'll come back and explain the point of all of that. At the same time, other models have grown up. There is the model of national courts trying major crimes against international law. International law is enforced not only at the international level, but also through domestic legal systems and domestic court systems. Perhaps the most famous example is the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Israel in 1961, where a national court was applying international law principles, including crimes against humanity and the, an equivalent crime to genocide. Um, more recently, the trial of Klaus Barbie in France was another example of that. And a third model that has emerged is the hybrid tribunal with international and national elements combining to create uh, benches of judges who come from both 
uh, UN appointed uh, panels and also from uh, uh, appointments by the national government. Cambodia and Sierra Leone are examples of that. And there's another example, another uh, model, and that is the Iraq tribunal, which is really a domestic tribunal, albeit with provision for international input and consultancy. I would call that the modified hybrid tribunal. In addition, we have the International Criminal Court, which is an international permanent tribunal, uh, and we've heard about that this morning already. The point about all of this is that the Nuremberg model was a major breakthrough, but being the product of human ingenuity and being, uh, and being, uh, um, I've lost the word, and being executed by human beings, it can only be as imperfect as human beings themselves are. There were imperfections, there were shortcomings in the Nuremberg model. One of those was that they were ad hoc tribunals. They were tribunals which were set up for a particular purpose and they were disbanded as soon as that purpose had been achieved. It goes without saying that in an ideal world we want a permanent tribunal which is not subject to the political whims of the time. Political winds which blow today may allow for a tribunal to be set up, but they can be very different the next day. In 1945, it was very easy for the United States and the Soviet Union to agree on uh, setting up tribunals to try the Nazis. On how many things did those two superpowers agree over the next 45 years? So, in an ideal world, we want a permanent tribunal, and the International Criminal Court, created in 1998, serves that purpose. A second shortcoming in the Nuremberg model was that it was the victors trying the vanquished. And in an ideal world, we want the prosecutors to have access to all information and lay charges where the chips fall irrespective of which side a person is on. It's very rarely the case that in an international conflict, one side has a monopoly on uh, abuse of human rights norms. These are all important developments that have been traceable and are traceable back to the Nuremberg model. And there is an important statement by President Truman which ensured that the model was created and his efforts to ensure that there were orderly trials mean that we owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude for that reason alone. At the substantive level, the main innovation at Nuremberg, which made it unique, was that charges were laid against individuals who led an aggressive war in the case of Germany and at the same time who uh, perpetrated massive human rights violations in the course of the Holocaust. The Nuremberg tribunals tried leaders of Germany for planning and executing a war of aggression and also for crimes against humanity, meaning major atrocities killing on a mass scale, torture on a mass scale, slavery on a mass scale. The three human rights, which we've heard about already this morning, which go to the heart of the dignity of the human being. Hu crimes against humanity, together with the associated crime genocide, are today the staple jurisdictional bases of every single tribunal in the world of whatever nature. And again, we owe that tremendous debt of gratitude to President Truman for his moral clarity in seeing the importance of ensuring that these sorts of crimes were brought to uh, justice in an orderly way. So that was the first major rationale, create international law precedents. The second major rationale, which was already alluded to in the first passage from uh, President Truman's remarks, 
was we have to create a high moral plane. We are a civilized community. We deal with things in a civilized way. If people are guilty of major human rights violations, let them be found guilty, but after a process of orderly trials in which they are given every opportunity to put forward their best foot and uh, defend themselves. Give them every uh, access to fairness and to due process. If after that they're found guilty, let them be dealt with accordingly. The so-called political solution, taking them out and shooting them, is exactly the way they behaved. And we've seen Truman uh, accentuate that particular point. And the third and very, very important reason, rationale, for having orderly trials at Nuremberg was, let us create the historical record. The Nazi regime was unique in historical terms in the lengths to which they went to document everything there is an extraordinary uh, array of archives and caches of documents uh, still to this day being opened uh, of records which document everything down to the amount of hair that was taken off, that was shaved off victims before they were pushed into gas chambers, of the number of shoes taken from victims before they were uh, put to death, and so on and so on. And what Truman and Jackson wanted to achieve was to create an historical record, pull all of this together and create a massive repository of documentary evidence about this regime of evil to permit scholars, students, and others to examine the material and learn firsthand from those documents what this regime was all about so that lessons can be learned from the future, for the future. Very, very importantly, Truman and Jackson very presciently foresaw the day of Holocaust denial, and they felt that it would be important to bring together the documentary evidence of the Nazi regime in order to pull the rug out from people who one day would deny that there have ever been such a, an event as the Holocaust, or who would downplay it and minimize it in ugly, ugly terms. We also owe a tremendous debt of gratitude for the same reason to General Eisenhower as he then was. Uh, I'm speaking about this at a workshop this afternoon. But General Eisenhower also understood the importance of writing the historical record. When he started liberating concentration camps, one of the first things he did was to order in army photographers and filmmakers and to cable overseas, inviting uh, officials in Washington and in London and also the press in those capital cities and elsewhere to come and look for themselves and record what was being seen because Eisenhower also remarkably foresaw the era of Holocaust denial, and he said, I'm witnessing this myself because I want to ensure that th steps are taken for the day when someone puts this down to propaganda. That's almost his exact phrase. And we'll deal with that in more detail in the workshop this afternoon. And so we owe this tremendous debt of gratitude to President Truman and Justice Jackson because they helped write the historical record. And uh, very interestingly, they weren't the only ones who saw the importance of writing the historical record. Hermann Goering on the Nazi side also understood the significance of writing history from his point of view. He walked into the trial at Nuremberg determined to, quote, write a positive legend, unquote. That was the way he expressed himself. And he set about putting spin 
on the whole Nazi era and on Hitler himself. He was a spinmeister before that term was coined. And so one sees in evidence of his cross-examination, film of his cross-examination, that he sits there with a straight face and says, oh, you know, of course a few people were hurt here and there. In the early days there was a bit of violence and so on. Things got out of hand, you know, boys will be boys. But overall, it was the least bloody revolution in history. His exact words, the least bloody revolution in history. And when he talks about Hitler, he says, Hitler didn't really know about details. Sir David Maxwell Fife, the chief British prosecutor, uh, an experienced trial lawyer himself, asks him, well, Hitler must have known about the concentration camps and the mass killings and so on. Hitler didn't know about details. And Sir David Maxwell Fife leaps in and asks a brilliant question. He says, I'm not talking about details. I'm talking about the murder of four or five million people. Are you seriously suggesting that other than Himmler and perhaps Kaltenbrunner, no one in the regime knew what was going on. And of course, you only had to articulate the proposition in order to underscore its inherent improbability. Writing the historical record, we see traces of that in the modern era with Slobodan Milosevic in his trial and uh, Saddam Hussein in his trial. Both of them were acutely conscious that their trials were being beamed by television to very large audiences. Truman and Jackson understood at the outset the significance of writing the historical record, and Truman and Jackson presciently and quite uncannily, together with Eisenhower, foresaw the day of Holocaust denial. We are still, of course, in... Uh, an era when Holocaust uh, survivors are still alive, sadly dwindling in numbers, and yet there are people who deny that it ever happened. And 65 years ago, right at the threshold of the post-World War II history, these people understood instinctively that one day this might happen, and we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. Let's have a look at clip number two now, Ellis, please. This is Truman again. Punishment should not be meted out without a trial. The trial was what I was fighting for. I wanted to make it impossible for anybody to say that this was just a lot of propaganda, that it didn't happen, that it was a fact of lies. I wanted to fix it so things would be down in black and white, and the evidence would be available for future, future generations, just like it was to us. And that was the reason I wanted trials. Thank you. There it is, in his own words, to make it impossible for people in future generations to say that it didn't happen, I wanted the evidence to be there for all to see and learn from. And then let's have a look at the final clip. Now posterity may forget their names, but nobody can say that it never happened because of things on the record. Never again can men say, I was following orders. And never again can men in power give such orders. It is a precedent which will last in history. And I'm as happy as I can be that we were able to establish that precedent, hoping always that there'll never be another world war or any other kind of a war. But if there is one, these people will understand that they're up for punishment if they carry on the horror such as Hitler and Mussolini did. There it is. He repeats the earlier point about denial, Holocaust denial, but then he goes on and summarizes the initial point I made, the initial rationale, which was let there be international law precedence. And as a subset of that, he focuses on a defense at Nuremberg, namely the defense of superior orders. We were acting under orders. Now, the general point he makes is very important, and it's a segue into my concluding remarks about his role in the uh, Nuremberg trials. 
The Nuremberg trials set many monumental precedents for the post-World War II era, which have seeped down into the 21st century. To me, the central and most important lesson and message sent by the Nuremberg trials is the one which Truman alluded to in that last, passage, in that last uh, clip. The message is that individuals live simultaneously in two legal systems, the national legal system and the international legal system. And it is not sufficient for someone to look at the national legal system to see what is lawful under the national legal system and even what is required under the national legal system without having regard to the possibility that the international legal system may take a very, very different view and that they may eventually be held accountable in that international legal system. That's really what Truman was saying in that last clip. It's of monumental significance, and it's a, a significance that applies not only to the political and military leaders of a country. They were the ones who were tried in the major trial, the leaders of the political and military establishments of Nazi Germany who were still alive and in captivity. But subsequently, the United States, acting in the U.S. zone of occupation under international law and by agreement with the uh, other allied victors, conducted a series of 12 trials, known colloquially as the subsidiary trials. And those trials were conducted roughly by profession. There was the trial of the doctors, the leading figures in the Nazi medical establishment who had committed massive atrocities in the name of medicine and in the name of science. There was the trial of the lawyers, the leading figures in the Nazi legal establishment who had perverted Germany's legal system beyond recognition and converted it into an instrument of brutality. And so on and so on. There were the leaders of great industrial concerns such as IG Farben. The point is that these subsidiary trials gave effect to what I would call the Hilberg principle. Dr. Raoul Hilberg, the doyen of Holocaust historians in this country, made a very perceptive comment in one of his earlier books in which he says that every profession and occupation in Germany was represented in the Holocaust. I won't go into details now, but I'm happy to answer questions about how that was so. That doesn't mean to say that every individual within every profession and occupation was involved in the Holocaust, but certainly there were representatives of every profession and occupation. The point, therefore, is that the major lesson which I've just sketched about accountability in the international legal system applies not only to the military and political leaders of a country, but it potentially applies to every single person in the society. And this is a critical lesson um, which has emerged from the Nuremberg model and the Nuremberg precedent. And again, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to President Harry S. Truman for insisting that there be orderly trials, and ultimately for insisting that the orderly trials give rise to these important and abiding lessons. Let me turn now to another very, very important aspect of President Truman's post-Holocaust involvement. May the 8th, 1945, was VE Day, victory in Europe. People were liberated, quote-unquote, but so many didn't want to return home. For the Jews, home was a place of oppression. They had horrific memories of their home countries, their home regions, their home cities and towns. There was hostility and hatred that was still palpable. And so they became displaced persons. They had nowhere to go, unlike the 
non-Jewish people who were liberated on VE Day. They did have a place to go home by and large. So the Jews were put into what were termed helter-skelter camps. They were rounded up by the Allied armies and they were put into these camps under armed guard. They were known as displaced persons camps. The official rationale was, we're putting you in there for your own good, to make sure that you have the right food and so on, but there was also an unstated, officially at least, fear that the Jews, if allowed out of these camps, would roam the countryside and wreak vengeance on the people who had inflicted the horrors on them. Conditions in the DP camps were pretty miserable. They were terribly overcrowded. Um, in so many cases, the Jews were forced to wear their concentration camp uniforms. There were armed guards who prevented them from leaving. Um, and in many cases, the camps, in fact, were converted old concentration camps. They lacked basics like soap and toothpaste and toothbrushes and towels. Demoralizingly, there was no way they could contact their relatives. And very demoralizingly, they were not treated separately. What that means is that they were grouped by nationality. All the Poles were together, Polish Jews and non-Jews. Uh, all the Germ uh, Germans were together. And uh, the same applied to other nationalities. What that meant was that very often the Jews were placed in DP camps together with their tormentors of the same nationality. At the same time, in all of those conditions, they could stand there in the camps and look outside, out of the camps, and see how life was returning to normal. And yet they weren't allowed to go out and participate in that return to normalcy. It was not a pleasant situation. In 1945, in June of that year, word got back to President Truman that conditions in the DP camps were terrible. The army heard that he'd received word, and they said to him, um, don't worry, everything's fine, just leave it to us. So the moment Truman heard from the army, don't worry, he began to worry. And what he did was he acted with alacrity and he appointed a one-man commission of inquiry to go over to Europe, examine the DP camps personally and report back to him. The one-man commission of inquiry was a fascinating man by the name of Earl Harrison, who, as it happens, at that very time was dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where I happen to be teaching today. He went there mid-career after having established himself in government with a very, very distinguished um, career behind him already at that stage. So he went off to Europe and spent the whole of July 1945 touring 30 camps, which meant an average of one a day. And very significantly, he departed from the itinerary which the army had prepared for him. He showed the itinerary to a Christian clergyman who took one look at it and said, the army doesn't want you to see what's going on. And he lined it up with him to ensure that Harrison could depart from that and go and see what was really going on. Harrison kept notes, he kept a diary, and that's at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, which, and it's a very important document because it fills in the details behind the report. I spent a fascinating day sitting there and going through this diary page by page. The Harrison report, as it came to be known, was a scathing indictment of the Army's treatment of the DPs. The most controversial phrase which leaps out of that was, we are treating them just like the Nazis, the only difference is that we don't kill them. That's almost word for word. Uh, it's very controversial because a lot of people took issue with the way he characterized uh, life in the camps. Uh, the army in particular was pretty upset. Um, and if you talk to survivors of DP camps, and we may be able to hear from one or more of them a little bit later on, 
what they've told me certainly is that um, certainly it was no Hilton Hotel, but it was certainly a heck of a lot better than what we had suffered afterwards. So from a relative point of view, uh, the DP camp conditions might have been quite good, but that's not the perspective from which Earl Harrison examined the camps. He examined those camps from the perspective of an American going over and having a look at what uh, conditions there were in those camps. As a result of his conclusion, Harrison made two groundbreaking recommendations. The first was you have to separate out the Jews and treat them separately as Jews. Even though on the surface, superficially at least, it made sense to keep people together if they were bound by a common language, but the point he made was these people were persecuted as Jews, they were singled out as Jews for treatment by the Nazi regime, and therefore you have to treat them separately in order to help them recover. In particular, that meant you have to separate them out from other nationals. And secondly, it means you have to let them live as Jews. So if there are those among them who want special dietary requirements, kosher food, you have to cater to that. And he also said if there are those who want to practice their religious rituals and beliefs, then you should uh, make sure that the conditions are there for them to do so. That was... Recommendation number one. Recommendation number two was that 100,000 certificates be issued to allow the Jews in DP camps to migrate to uh, the territory of Palestine under the British mandate, the League of Nations mandate, which was being administered by the British, to which Dr. Raphael Medoff referred at some length uh, in his earlier presentation. The reason he made that recommendation, the reason it was important, was because in 1939 the British had issued an infamous white paper. They were administering the territory of Palestine under a mandate, under a trust, issued by the League of Nations, and in 1939, in this white paper, they fixed a quota of 1,500 people coming into Palestine per month. That was paltry. The reason Earl Harrison recommended 100,000 new permits and certificates was that that was the number of displaced persons who were Jews. And he had surveyed them himself in touring these 30 camps. He had asked them, where would you like to go? Answer, Palestine. What's your second preference? Answer, Palestine. That was one line of response. The second line was terrible to, to read and hear about. Where do you want to go? Palestine. What's your second preference? Gas chamber. And there were people who actually said that to him, and it made a very, very deep impression on him. Years, a year later, in 1946, he gave a radio interview, and the transcript of this is in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and he was asked, in all innocence by the interviewer, um, are there any other places where these Jews can go? And he answered, yes, there are, but that's quite beside the point because these people have been pulled around by the nose for far too long. Their wishes have not been respected and now it's time to respect their wishes. If they want to go to Palestine, then that's where they should be allowed to go. Here we see also a moral clarity. Yes, there are other places where they can be sent, but that's beside the point. Truman's reaction to all of this was very swift and very decisive. In his memoirs, he writes, the Harrison Report was a moving document. The misery it depicted could not be allowed to continue. The timeline in all of this was very interesting. In June... Truman receives word about terrible conditions in the DP camps. On the 23rd of June, he appoints Harrison. Harrison is over there within a week, and he spends the whole of July in uh, Germany touring camps, 
And on August the 8th, a mere eight days after finishing his tour, he reports to Truman, and on August the 31st, 23 days later, barely three weeks later, Truman writes a letter to Eisenhower as commander-in-chief, supreme allied commander. The message is, I have adopted the Harrison report and you are instructed to ensure that the recommendations are carried out. He was firm, he was unequivocal, although he went to great pains to ensure that the message got across. He wasn't blaming Eisenhower himself. What he was saying was there are people below who are not carrying out what really is US policy. That was in relation to the DP camps themselves. And the principal point was separate out the Jews and let them live like Jews in these camps. As far as the second recommendation was concerned, immigration to Palestine, Truman had really very little control over this. It was the British who were administering this territory which had been carved out of the Ottoman Empire. However, despite the fact that it was the British who were in charge, Truman made concerted efforts to get them to change their policy at Potsdam in July, that is before the report was in his hands even, he pressed Churchill to issue another 100,000 certificates of entry into Palestine, and he said, quote, without delay, unquote. It's interesting to speculate what would have happened had there not been an election in Britain a very, very short time after the Potsdam... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's just... Uh, occurred to me that um, there had already been an election and Churchill was uh, co continuing on at, at Potsdam. That's my recollection, although they hadn't formally taken over yet. So the election had taken place, the election took place around that time, and Clement Attlee came to power as Prime Minister. The result of that was that there was a fundamental shift in uh, British attitude. Truman therefore wrote to Attlee imploring him to issue 100,000 more certificates. This was against advice from the State Department. Don't do it, they said. Don't offend the Arabs. They were very concerned about Arab oil, even in those days, and they were concerned that an effort like this to have another 100,000 Jews enter the territory of Palestine would have created problems for the United States as far as Arab oil was concerned. Truman's reaction was typical. He said they're more worried about the Arab reaction than about the suffering of the Holocaust victims. Attlee balked at the suggestion that 100,000 more um, uh, uh, certificates should be, uh, should be issued. Um, and in typical British fashion, um, he suggested a joint US-UK commission of inquiry to inquire into this. This is um, a time-honored way of disposing of a problem, at least temporarily, hoping that uh, in that way it'll go away permanently. It's not unique to the British, but the British have developed it to, a, to an art form. Attlee himself was not only worried about Arab oil, but it had this extraordinary notion that Jews should be repatriated to their countries of origin. The Commission of Inquiry was very, very th thorough. They traveled to the Middle East, and they traveled to Europe. They took evidence, and they considered the problem in great depth, and they came up with a unanimous recommendation adopting the Harrison approach. They were unanimous. In uh, the United States, Truman immediately accepted that. Britain said no. They rejected it out of hand, which indicated and confirmed, really, that that's what they had intended to do all along, but the Commission of Inquiry bought them an additional five months.
it's interesting to look at the statistics. Britain allowed 1,500 immigrants into Palestine per month. On the day after Israel declared independence, in May of 1948, 1,700 immigrants came into Palestine, and from May to December of that year, they averaged 13,500 per month. And it makes you wonder how many lives could have been saved had uh, Britain had a change of heart in the 1930s. In the United States, Truman worked very hard to ease immigration restrictions, and Dr. Medoff explained that those restrictions were quota-based, and there was a very strong emphasis on British and Scandinavian um, immigrants. Uh, Truman worked towards the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, hand-in-hand hand with Earl Harrison. I had lunch with Earl Harrison's son, Bart, who is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, not surprisingly, and he told me that his fathers had uh, set up an organization, um, a non-governmental organization, to work towards um, reforming U.S. immigration laws, and that at that time, they had spent something like four, somewhere between four and six million dollars on this campaign, an absolutely astronomical sum. The idea was to get 400,000 extra immigrants into this country. Congress was very much opposed to it. On, on the last day of a congressional sitting, they passed the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, but with a restriction in terms of a date, a cut-off date, and that meant that 90% of the Jews who could have benefited from this were excluded. Truman was livid. He signed the legislation. He said, I have no choice at the moment. It's the last day of the sitting. This is better than nothing. It at least establishes the principle for which I'm working, and I'm now going to work very hard to uh, ease the restriction that Congress has imposed, and he worked for the next two years, and in 1950, the Displaced Persons Act was amended to lift the restriction with the result that in the succeeding two years, 395,000 people came into this country, so many of them um, Jewish victims of the Holocaust. As a side note, uh, among those were also um, immigrants who had been Holocaust-era perpetrators and who lied about their past in order to get in. So all of this was a tremendous humanitarian act. And when we put it all together, we see what I believe are some very important qualities which President Truman displayed in this area. First of all, the moral clarity which we saw in relation to the Nuremberg trials. Uh, Truman says, look, these are human beings, that's the first consideration, and they have to be treated like human beings. General Patton, I might add, said something very, very different. He says, Harrison and his ilk regard displaced persons as human beings, which they are not. Patton actually said that. Secondly, Truman took the view they have suffered unspeakable horrors. The first priority, the overriding priority, is to help them. And thirdly, they should be allowed to go wherever they want to go. Again, moral clarity. In all of this, Truman was prepared to take on the State Department. He was prepared to take on the British government. He was prepared to take on, if need be, Arab governments wielding an oil weapon. And within the United States, it wasn't just the State Department, but it was also the Defense Department. There were various interest groups like the Veterans of Foreign Wars and so on, as well as public opinion, to which Dr. Medoff referred. He was prepared to take all of that on. He wasn't um, phased by... Uh, the fact that so many obstacles were placed in his way and so many forces were working against him, both internationally as well as nationally, and he was prepared to plow on, uh, given that his sense of moral clarity told him, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it come what may.
I'm happy to take questions. I've finished, by the way. Thank okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The question is where his moral clarity came from, and I don't purport to be um, an expert on uh, Truman's background and childhood and upbringing, but um, let me tell you what sense I get from the researches that I've done. Number one, his uh, religious upbringing. Uh, number two, the values that were instilled in him at home and the small town country values, um, which in his case were very, very positive. Um, you do what's right. And uh, that was his personality. And the, this sort of background and upbringing uh, shone through. Um, he was a, put it this way, he was a um, wonderful receptacle for the inculcation of those values. He was a straight shooter by nature. Yes, sir. Mm. Apparently, when Eisenhower took office, he snubbed Truman and would not have tea with him, which was a custom prior to uh, the inauguration. Uh, some thoughts about that had been uh, that uh, Eisenhower was running the DP camps that Truman dis disliked a lot. Another one was that Eisenhower was upset, seriously upset with Truman for dropping the atom bomb in Japan because he felt that the Russians were now in the war and would have ended the war pretty soon, but Truman supposedly did that for political gain and just, quote, scared the communists. Mm. So I don't really know. Can you shed any light on the relationship? Uh, I have a strong sense that uh, the Harrison report was a source of friction between the two. If you read the letter that Truman wrote to Eisenhower um, covering the Harrison report which he enclosed, um, even though he went to pains to paint lower down uh, military uh, officers as being responsible, nevertheless, in broad terms, it was um, an attack on Eisenhower, and certainly Eisenhower saw that because he was the man responsible at the end of the day. And if you read his uh, response very, very carefully, you see that on the one hand, he's telling Truman, you're wrong. You've just got it wrong because Harrison's got it wrong, and Harrison has failed to take into account a whole lot of things. And if you go further, however, you see that... Um, there's a lot of truth in what Harrison said, and if you read between the lines of the Eisenhower response, you see that he's really admitting there were problems, but we have, um, we have um, implemented major improvements. I'm paraphrasing. Now, if you look at what he's saying, um, it's uh, implicit in that that there were problems and that improvements had been uh, instituted very, very quickly. So I can see that that was a source of uh, friction between the two. Did not Harry Truman originally uh, request that Dwight Eisenhower run for president under the Democratic rather than... It was possible, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. I grew up in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could clarify the national versus international tribunal. I mean, in every conflict... Soldiers do some pretty awful things. Yes. Mm -hmm. When should they be tried under the, their own nation's mm -hmm. military code or whatever you call it? And when should it be international? The, the question is the relationship between national law and international law and when perpetrators commit um, acts of uh, violation of human rights, should they be tried nationally or internationally and when should they be tried nationally and uh, when should they be tried internationally. 
there are two points that need to be made in relation to this. Number one is that before the Second World War, there was no such thing as the international human rights movement. The Holocaust was the catalyst for the whole human rights movement because the Holocaust demonstrated all too vividly, all too graphically, and ultimately all too horrifically the ultimate depths and beyond to which human nature and human society are capable of sinking absent a meaningful system of um, definition and implementation and enforcement of human rights. Now, in that way, I might add parenthetically, international law actually played into Hitler's hands because Hitler agreed that there was no such thing as human rights. Human rights, as the term implies, means that you have rights simply and solely by virtue of being a human being, irrespective of any other considerations, for instance, the race to which you belong. Hitler, in his chapter in Mein Kampf entitled Nation and Race, took a very, very radically different position, and that was the underlying racial ideology that um, drove the regime. Now, what that means is that it's only in the, second, in, in the years since the Second World War that the option of an international tribunal has arisen because of the Nuremberg precedent. And secondly, it's only since then that the option of charging people with human rights violations has arisen because there was no such thing uh, before the Second World War. So that's point number one. Point number two is that there is a relationship that has developed between international and national tribunals, and by and large, without uh, being absolute about this, but by and large, the um, consensus is that if credible and meaningful trials can take place at the national level, uh, that system has first preference. We see that in relation to um, uh, to say the uh, Yugoslav Tribunal um, and uh, the, a, sub, a subset of that point is that there are competing, competing considerations when there is a choice between uh, sending something to a national tribunal, sending something to an international tribunal and that's why we have the hybrid tribunals. The argument in favour of having international tribunals try um, atrocity, uh, crimes arising out of human rights atrocities, the argument is the tribunals are more objective, they're detached, um, and in some cases the dictator of the former country, such as Saddam Hussein in uh, Iraq, the former dictator of the country, I should say, has so decimated the legal system that you can't rely on getting a decent judiciary to try people. That's the argument in favour of an international tribunal. The argument in favour of a national tribunal um, is that in, so, in several cases in uh, the modern era, in particular Iraq, uh, there's been pressure to put people on trial nationally because and I'm paraphrasing, this guy was our dictator, he committed atrocities against us, we are his worst victims, and therefore we should have a, a right to uh, bring this man to justice and see that justice is, in, is done. Um, <clears throat> one of the factors in that is that if you have an international tribunal, um, it's often sitting in a remote place, and therefore the local population doesn't get the sense of justice that comes with having the trial take place uh, in the capital city. And this was one of the important factors uh, motivating the, the leaders of Iraq immediately after Saddam Hussein's downfall. The example of that is in the tribunal for Rwanda because it's sitting not in Rwanda, it's an international tribunal, but it's sitting in neighboring Tanzania in the capital city, Kinshasa. And there's been a complaint voiced quite generally in Rwanda. This is too remote for us. We're not really getting a proper sense of justice. And a proper sense of justice can take many, many different forms so that on the day after Saddam Hussein was captured, there was a front-page story, of course, in the New York Times, and they uh, interviewed the man in the street in Baghdad. There was a guy who said, 
he was asked, what would you like to see happen to Saddam Hussein? And he said, I'd like to see him tied by one leg behind a course and cart and dragged through the streets of Baghdad with people throwing stones at him until the life goes out of him. That is one sense of justice. But uh, short of that, if you have uh, courts that are trying people, there is a stronger sense of justice and a stronger sense of closure, to use a modern term, um, if the trial takes place locally rather than in some remote capital city. These are the sorts of considerations that come into the equation when you're deciding between national and international courts. And so th thanks again to Professor Harry Riker for his outstanding talk, and I'm sure he'd be willing to engage you all in, in, in further uh, question and answer dialogue after uh, today's session. Um, this almost concludes the morning portion of our conference. A, fair, a few very, very brief remarks before we conclude. First, my colleague Professor Ann Saltzman already pointed out um, to all of you that you have in your packets membership cards for the Center for Holocaust Genocide Study. We would be very pleased if you'd consider joining the Center as members. Um, secondly, um, I'd also like to point out again that you have evaluation forms in your packets, and we think that it'd probably be a good idea to make some brief remarks about the individual speakers immediately after their talks, um, and then hand in the evaluation before you leave. And then lastly, all of you should have a sal Salomon-colored covered piece of paper in your packet. It lists the afternoon workshops that you have pre-registered for. It also lists your lunch selection if you are joining us for lunch, as many of you 